I think Bitcoin takes something from all governments inherently, right? It sort of de facto strips the state of its monopoly on the production of money. That's sort of a, a given. But I think Bitcoin takes and it gives. And I think when you weigh out what it takes away with respect to government control, but what it provides with respect to the empowering of individuals and the granting of economic activity, the ability to engage in economic activity for people who otherwise don't have that ability, yeah, I, I think that the net benefits and cost analysis, like Bitcoin is certainly far better for the West than it is for our, our more authoritarian like adversaries. All right, David Zell, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks. Thanks for reaching out. Yeah, man, excited to chat. I think you're doing some really interesting work, I think, on a site that is not highlighted enough. You know, in, in, in the policy space, you're, I might say, basically a Bitcoin lobbyist in a sense, right? I think that's uh, just really cool. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> or is I'm that not a sure dirty word? A, <laughs> you know, it's not a dirty word. It's just, you know, adjacent to, but not quite what I do. Okay. Well, then I'm going to learn about that today. See, that's why we should talk about it more <laughs> because I know it's important what you do. But yeah, let's, let's get into it. So first, of course, I wanted to start kind of with like, what was your first experience? with Bitcoin and, you know, how did your perspective on its potential evolve? Yeah, I think I've talked about this on other podcasts. I first kind of came across Bitcoin and bought a little bit of it for sort of transactional purposes, not not to invest in um, when I was in middle school in like seventh grade. It was like 2013. And I guess then I very quickly both understood and like misunderstood Bitcoin. I wasn't skeptical of it really at all. It made complete sense to me. Again, being 13, I was not <laughs> exactly sophisticated, but I, you know, appreciated that its fluctuating price was, you know, a reflection of it not being backed by anything. And that idea did not give me any pause, right? Like, I think the the vibe of sort of memeing the new money into existence was both cool to me and like sensible, but it also didn't feel like it was early. Like I recall sort of thinking like, wow, had I invested in this, you know, had I bought some of this like earlier, you know, in sixth grade, mm -hmm. maybe I'd be rich. You know, it, it, it definitely felt like that's what Bitcoin was. It was $63, $65, whatever it was. And like, you know, it hovered around, but all right, you know, it, I sort of misunderstood that that price was going to be stable. And I, and I mistakenly thought that it was sort of too late to do anything other than use it. So from there, I guess my evolution into it was having to research crypto for a high school debate topic involving sanctions and then being like, oh shit, like, I think I have some, you know, some dust in this, like, you know, this Bitcoin wallet you know, and, and holy shit, it's actually a lot more, you know, than it, than it was like, that's crazy. So then I appreciated a little bit more that like Bitcoin had like, okay, a fixed supply. Like that was a big thing I didn't get early. I just, you know, didn't think about it. And, you know, I'll say like, I remember like sitting in my high school library, there was like sixth grade, fifth grade through 12th grade. So my, my school library and like searching Bitcoin on Google and seeing like an NPR article about it. There's like, I think a New York Times article about it. Like, I feel like what people miss about Bitcoin commentary was like, this stuff's been, people have been saying this stuff for a long time. And so like, then it really felt like, oh yeah, like this is like a sort of known thing. Like it was, there's nothing, no part of it struck me as like, I, so I felt like everybody who would ever buy Bitcoin had already bought it by that point, yeah, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. So came across it later, you know, in high school and realized that I, would you know, profited uh, and it wasn't much, but I was like, oh yeah, cool. Like, you know, this has gone up a lot. And then I really sort of, so I guess at that point, it was like something that I had invested in and didn't think much about. Like it wasn't anything other than, you know, sort of a speculative bet on something cool and admittedly a bit of like sort of FOMO slash being annoyed that I wasn't, you know, some giga rich person because the time, you know, the, the, the price had gone up a lot since my, my first contact with it. And then going into college, I got connected with David Bailey, who was in the same program as me at the University of Alabama. And that's sort of how I got started, like working in the space, getting a lot more, <laughs> You know, meeting David, I think, kind of accelerated Bitcoin from being like 
low, relatively low on my list of like niche interests to, Mm -hmm. you know, my professional life. So that was sort of my, I guess, arc uh, from first contact to now. And so can you remember what, what triggered you in that? Like, how did it move up from, okay, nice, it still exists. My dust became a little bit more like, was there anything that really triggered you? I think actually interesting what you mentioned when you first saw it, that the volatility is a feature, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I I was always a bit of a, I don't want to say radical, but I always had sort of contrarian political takes. I was especially when I was younger, was like very interested in, I was much more interested in what the world could like, could look like than what the world like did look like. So I was really drawn to a lot of like pretty far left, like thinking around economics and then sort of political philosophy. And and so really, I think my kind of first meaningful thoughts about Bitcoin, aside from like, oh, this is neat, you know, were, you know, I, I think at the time, probably a misdiagnosis of what I, not what I would agree with now, but at the moment it was like, oh, maybe this is something that can, you know, ameliorate somehow some of the problems of late stage, like financial capitalism. The, I think I was just attracted to the ambition of the project as well. Like sort of put bluntly, like really is this effort to, you know, meme a new form of value into existence. And I, of course, I don't mean use the word like meme pejoratively in this sense, but that collective undertaking, like I was a very like online kid. So like the idea of a bunch of smart, interesting people working really hard all over the world to kind of revolutionize the financial system to build something different that wasn't really tethered to like the legacy systems I think that like revolutionary impulse in Bitcoin is what really kind of caught my like sort of attention. Yeah, it's funny because we're actually doing it, right? It, it's the yeah. I know. And now we're now we're in the world of like Larry Fink and you know fastest ETF to fastest ETF to ever hit ten billion dollars in like what was yeah. it like thirty five, thirty five, thirty seven days, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's 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 pretty it's crazy. Um, yeah. Well, I love I love that. That is your angle. Like I, I discovered Bitcoin in 2013. I think at like, well, I bought my first at 400, but I recently looked up my tweets and I was tweeting about it when it was like a hundred. So like similar, nice. similar time, right? I even tweeted something like, you know, Bitcoin is a digital commodity, something, something. And I was like, damn, sure. I got it, but I didn't get it, you know? Like, right. <laughs> and, and so it goes up and down, but I love that, that kind of you found this angle of, and, and I, I, I do also see it like that now, just this internet, just this rebellious internet thing, right? I, 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 I truly believe like Bitcoin is not only internet money because you use it on the internet and it's digital, right? But the entire, culture or the way of it growing and shaping and this narrative, right? How, how we are manifesting it together, like the entire thing of, you know, the most entertaining outcome is the most likely, like it's literally that, right? Like it, it, once it does, you see Larry Fink on TV defending Bitcoin, that's the meme. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature fault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, BitGo, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. Yeah, it does. It does feel like that whatever that razor is, you know, is, is happening with respect to Bitcoin. I, you know, I have to say, like, I think one of my, one of the things I'm most sort of sad about is, and I suppose this was kind of inevitable, you know, as with any subculture that grows in popularity and kind of breaks into the mainstream you know it 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 loses it loses some of the things that like made it special in the first place in some ways right like you you know when you like a band and there's like you know a thousand other people that like this band you guys are on a on a wavelength very different than you and the rest of the fans when the you know they're playing out the super bowl or, or whatever and like 
Yeah, I, I thought that the 2021 bull run to me, like, I mean, it was already happening, like, of course, like way before, but I remember that sort of when we founded BPI, like, and, and yeah, I just, the, there, there was this sort of not only revolutionary spirit about early Bitcoin, but also this intellectual humility that really drew me into it. Like, I felt like a lot of the people who I would read these posts from on online, you know, it was like, everybody, right? It was economists, it was like lawyers, it was computer scientists, it was really bright kind of sort of eccentric minds from all of these disciplines coming together. And, you know, the premise was almost like failure, right? Like you can, I mean, even sort of the oft cited and repeated like early writings of Hal Finney or Satoshi, right? It might make sense to have a little bit in case it catches on, right? The base case was failure the tail scenario was success. And I would say like, you know, the present moment is almost characterized by an inversion of that where like, Mm. you know, especially in the Bitcoin community, the base case is unimaginable success and the tail risk is failure. And whether or not that's like accurate is a less interesting question to me than whether or not it's appropriate to behave like something is a sure thing when it really like isn't you know, we we're talking about elections before the podcast started and like i think one of the things people look back on hillary clinton's campaign you know and think is nobody wanted to vote for a president or you know a presidential candidate who behaved as though they were already president right mm-hmm. like she had this sort of air of like you know it's my it's my birthright i'm a clinton like you know i'm already president and it turned a lot of people off And I see some parallels there and have for years now in the Bitcoin space where I think the moon math and like the, we've lost that sort of sense of like intellectual humility in a lot of ways, at least by some of the biggest cheerleaders of of Bitcoin. And, And my suspicion is that that mindset, while sort of good for gaining followers and clicks on the internet, you know, might not be like the optimal sort of way to think about Bitcoin and to explain it to other people and to sort of steward this project along as a sort of one participant among many. And I think it's a lot of those like feelings about the space now compared to what it was that led me to sort of starting a Bitcoin think tank. Like I wanted to, you know, revive a bunch of the like, I don't know, the style of communication and discourse, all of it was just so much better on the talk forums than it's ever been on on Twitter. And yeah, I kind of wanted to recreate that energy of like, let's look at this from a rationalist perspective. Let's, you know, let's not treat anything as a given. Let's analyze this from sort of first principles with particular respect to its impact on the existing political order and, and the United States' sort of objectives as a nation generally. And so, yeah, that's what BPI basically was like for me. It was like this. I mean, we we have sort of ends outside of intellectual curiosity, but really the the sort of genesis of it was a desire to recreate some of the sort of serious thinking around Bitcoin that, you know, kind of got me hooked in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had a similar, for me, it's similar, but later I would say. So I kind of looked at it more from a technical angle. Then of course I had the shitcoin phase with all the ICOs and stuff, you know, and then slowly being drawn back in. But I think that intellectual curiosity is really what, what drove me like that. I, I found so many threads to pull on in so many different subjects that I never even looked at before. And when I really went into it, I was like, damn, okay, this is really interesting. Like I'm actually yeah, learning new stuff, right? And and kind of like challenging myself and et cetera. But I wanted to go back to, don't you, you know, this feeling of we are we are on the internet, you know, it's kind of secret, you know, it's random people meeting each other and we're trying to, you know, manifest this thing into existence as, as like some covert operation or whatever, right? And of, and of course that, that changes, but don't you, don't you still kind of feel like that rebel when you, for example, are in Washington and you have that presentation, right? I mean, there are people there that you are trying to inform, persuade, influence, whatever. I mean, I, I worked at a huge bank and I will always walked in in the morning with my little card and my backpack and on my backpack, I had like a little Bitcoin pin, like a gold yeah. Bitcoin pin. And I always felt like an intruder. 
you know, like <laughs> uh, I'm walking into this field thing, but I have my, I have my Bitcoin backpack on, you know, but that feeling is a, I think that's a fun feeling, don't you think? Like it, it just changes, but yeah, you are in other places now as well. Yeah. I mean, I would say that, you know, I have, yeah, a sort of not dissimilar feeling to, to kind of stumbling on this fairly early and it's, you know, and it's inception since its inception, but you know, it's, it's, it's almost more of like a surreality, right? It's like, you know, <laughs> whenever I'm talking to somebody in Washington about Bitcoin, whether it's doing like a briefing for staffers or, or meeting with someone, I, yeah, I do often just kind of think like how surreal and like kind of hilarious it is. But I also think it's like much more serious now. Right. Yeah. Like I, you know, like many people, I think I've abandoned a lot of my more revolutionary instincts of my youth in, in favor of, you know, what's a lot more kind of boring sort of centrist pragmatism. And, and you know, it's, it's funny because like as my politics have changed, the importance and role of Bitcoin in achieving those political ends has not really changed for me, which is sort of funny, just the way mm -hmm. that it does. Like, I no longer really think of, you know, of, of Bitcoin in, in the, it's the same degree that I did, you know, early in my life in terms of the impact that it would have on society. But I also think like the, the impacts that I think it'll have on society now, they're a lot narrower, but incredibly profound and like mm. impactful, you know? And, and so like, I don't, I'm not one of these people who thinks like Bitcoin's going to like end war, for example. I think that's a, a laughable proposition. I am not the kind of person who thinks that Bitcoin is good because it is going to aid in the collapse of like the nation state. Like I, you know, I don't think that's going to be the case. And in fact, the whole sort of thesis of BPI is that like the internet sort of properly leveraged Bitcoin as a network will probably aggregate disproportionate benefits to America and the West generally. Like, I, I think Bitcoin takes something from all governments, like, inherently, right? It sort of de facto strips the state of its monopoly on the production of money. That, that's sort of a, a given. But, it, but I think Bitcoin takes and it gives. And I think when you weigh out what it takes away with respect to government control, but what it provides with respect to the empowering of individuals and the, you know, granting of, of economic activity, the ability to engage in economic activity for people who otherwise don't have that ability. Yeah, I, I think that the net benefits and cost analysis, like Bitcoin is certainly far better for the West than it is for our, our more authoritarian like adversaries. And mm -hmm. so... It's, it's actually funny. It's, you know, <laughs> I no longer think of Bitcoin as some system to overthrow everything and start something new and make something better for people. But I think at a time where the global political economy, and this, this sort of shape and structure of it is more contested now than it's been in a long time. And there's a sort of serious contender on the other side, like in China and BRICS sort of offering a model for the governance of human beings that is morally abhorrent and gaining in popularity and traction all over the world. I, I think that there are these like sort of baked in premises to Bitcoin that are very similar to the baked in premises to like liberal democracy, right? Huh. That you have, you know, that, that, that the base layer of the system is the individual who in turn has rights to ownership, to transact, which, which in turn are these sort of gateway rights for achieving all of the rights really that we have in, in a liberal democracy. Yeah. I, 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 that, that's sort of what excites me now. It's less this like revolutionary instinct and more this, you know, Bitcoin embodying and supporting the general political economy that I want to see in the world at a time when that political economy cannot be taken for granted and, and is in great jeopardy, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you think it also changes because of course, when you are early and, and there's not as much traction and as there is now, right? Like the idea or kind of like fantasizing or brainstorming about like what this could be, of course, could go very, very far. Eventually you have to work with, with what is there. I, I do believe that, you know, as, as you mentioned, because Bitcoin exists in a parallel right next to an existing government or an authority that it also kind of acts as a mirror because 
you know, it cannot be changed. You don't have to, to trust anyone, etc. So it acts as a mirror for the for the for the other system. If if there are people within that system that could move to you know Bitcoin as a parallel system, so I do believe. Like I follow totally what you say, and I think it's true. But I also think it's kind of like the phase where Bitcoin is in. Like we're navigating where can we actually establish like some I want to say how do you say like like a like a stake or like where 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 do we put the flag in the ground basically and from there i would say like once it's really established that's also why i see these the bitcoin etfs for example really as a trojan horse in a sense i think it's just a really interesting development but i i do think over a long enough time frame and i of course don't know how long how long that is it 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 will eventually change human behavior in a certain way i also don't think war you know, will be will be gone, but we will go back to well. You said the word rational. I think more rational approaches to you know power projection, us- usage of resources of people, and and all these things. Just because there is a certain constraint with within the system of Bitcoin versus you know like the unlimited fake <laughs> debt resources of of this other system, right? So it will incentivize a certain shift in 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 human yeah. behavior. I think that's a that's a great way of like putting it, right? It doesn't necessarily like just by virtue of existing engender some particular state. Like that is entirely dependent on the yeah. aggregate behavior of a bunch of people faced with this system. But I think the setting of incentives is very true. Like a lot of thought has been put into you know, nation state attacks as like a concept, right? Like how could the nation state Mm -hmm. shut down Bitcoin, turn it off? I think that that's like largely a red herring though. You know, the, the more likely attack quote unquote is, is the one you don't even really see coming. You know, you're the sort of proverbial frog in the boiling pot or whatever. I think the ability of America in particular, but other countries as well, really America, to insidiously co-opt Bitcoin and neuter some of its potential that people are excited about while making its holders, you know, wealthy is an outcome that I fear far, far more than, Mm -hmm. yeah, like if, if all Bitcoin does is just kind of get early adopters like rich and become this cog in the extant financial system, you know, I don't. I don't think that's anything too exciting, except for the the personal holders of it, who, who you know, I guess might be excited. But you know, yeah, I don't know. There, it's it's a it's a fine line, and it really is this like incentives game, right? Like, it, you know, there's the argument about like should Bitcoin have had privacy on the base layer, and you know, it's hard because you can't really do the counterfactual like in a sort of logically coherent or like rigorous way. But one can easily imagine a world where Bitcoin, as it is, plus complete privacy may have led to a completely different, you know, set of out, you know, actions by the state. And maybe we Mm -hmm. don't have Larry Fink on television telling people to buy it. Uh, And and so like, you know, I think that's exactly what you're getting at, right? Is that like Bitcoin's in this sort of decentralized negotiation with states all around the world to sort of figure out, okay, like how far can this go? What guardrails are you going to put in place? Yeah. But, but I think that the ease with which the U S government could for example, just like issue Bitcoin backed dollars and then basically recreate the entire fiat system on top of Bitcoin is is probably underappreciated by a lot of mm. like Bitcoin enthusiasts. Like not this shutting down, but this, you know, go have what did Trump say at the conference? Go have fun playing with your with your yeah, Bitcoins that was, that was and your wild. and your cryptos, right? Like it's the world where we all get to have fun playing with it, but it doesn't do anything that is yeah. The most likely attack vector, I think. I think this is also a very good, very good point you made. I think this is also, at least for me, like an illustration of how early it is, right? Like I kind of still see it as like, it's a narrative game. Fiat money in general is a narrative game, right? But yeah, it, it becomes an even bigger, uh, even bigger narrative game because now there's this alternative system B, Bitcoin. That you can actually verify, right? Like the entire proof of work concept, etc. I, I love that because proof of work show, is, is like show and tell, right? And and fiat is only tell, and 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 people are conditioned to to listen to that. So 
that's why I think it's really cool what what you do with with your work and how you are trying to educate people because eventually I also think it's an individual mind virus. So even when you are part of a government or a big organ, organization, whatever, like you also have your own incentives, mm. right? The government's and you just, also it's just people. Yeah, exactly. It's just people, right? Yeah. It's all just people. Um, yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. So that that I think is gives me hope because eventually the, the, these people are forced to use the, the the fiat money as well. They also have that problem, right? And kind of lost my thought, but but my point is the point I wanted to make was that. Oh yeah, so I f- I feel it's, it's it's just a narrative game is upping and upping and upping and upping, right? You you know you walk into Washington with your Bitcoin mind, your 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 rebel internet mind, and and you are talking there to people like it's, it's it's slow, right? Like we are trying to change the biggest thing, which is money, and that just doesn't go as fast as how the internet went at least that's 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 my thesis right like sometimes people say like oh bitcoin is growing faster than the internet no i think the internet was fun and great for everyone yeah. you know changing money is not fun and great for everyone especially not the, not the people that are profiting from it right so i feel this this road is way way longer and of course it's interesting when you hear larry fink talk in a certain way yesterday actually i saw that little clip from him again And I think it's actually really interesting because there he says, like, you might want to get Bitcoin if you don't really trust your government's deficit spending. Um, we, he said something like, we all know that, you know, there's examples. It's so funny because he doesn't say the United States, right? Like, of course, he cannot say United States, but I saw it yesterday and I thought he, of course, knows this entire deficit. Like, he knows this in and out, right? And then he decides to adopt Bitcoin. Like, that is such a signal. Just for that personal person, whatever you think of BlackRock and all the other things, but you know, eventually it's this individual thing that you need to challenge. Yeah, yeah. I kind of lost my point. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you when, when, when. So you mentioned Bitcoin Policy Institute. When did you decide to commit to that? Like what you said, like I wanted to bring the this rational thinking back. Was there a specific moment where you when you were like, okay, now now is the moment to start this? Yeah, I think it was the sort of the unhosted wallets and sort of like the IRS infrastructure, the, the broker bill, like the, the sort of whole infrastructure bill debacle of 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 twenty twenty one. There, I observed what I felt to be a material white space in the landscape of Bitcoin and government relations. <laughs> I observed that there were a lot of lobbyists, both sort of retained by these big crypto companies and and advocacy groups. I saw that there were like really awesome think tanks in Washington, like Coin Center being the best example, like just doing fantastic work. But but the white space that I observed was that there seemed to be a shortage of conversation, of research, education, advocacy around Bitcoin's utility to the U.S. Like, why is this thing good? And I think, like, in any debate, in any policy debate, uh, it's easy to get lost in, like, the minutia and just sort of take for granted that regulating Bitcoin well in alignment with certain values or principles or to achieve certain ends is like a given, it's like a good thing. And I think that's a bit of a mistake. Like, I think, of course, like you said, the government is just comprised of individuals and you're going to care about a technology that is that you see as a, for example, a strategic asset to the United States. You're going to care about that technology's regulation a lot more than if, if you just think that technology is a platform for speculation or, or for criminal activity. So what I wanted to do with BPI was kind of go a layer above like lobbying, you know, less like, oh, the bill should say X instead of Y, but more getting people on board with this idea that uh, the proliferation of Bitcoin like would yield tangible net benefits to the United States and its allies. And that this is like a sort of subject that is worthy of serious consideration as it relates to like our national security, our kind of grand strategy, our, our sort of geopolitical maneuvering. You know, Bitcoin is this one tool out of like many that we should seriously consider. And, and, 
you know, that was something that I didn't see a lot of. Like I saw a lot of, anyway, and, I, and I couldn't help but think that that might be part of the issue that it might, that it might, you know, in ultimately engender better policy outcomes for Bitcoin if we convince people to care about Bitcoin. <laughs> so yeah. like that is really the, the, the through line of BPI is like trying to get people to care and see why this stuff is of consequence to these broader priorities that our government cares deeply about. Yeah. So do you use from what I've heard and, and seen from you, you, you already had like a policy and, and like a public affairs background a little bit, a little bit. I mean, I'm, yeah. this was like my first real job or like project. Um, yeah. I, I did some nonprofit work in college, you know, but I, I, Sort of, and I, and I worked at Bitcoin Magazine doing like policy and public affairs stuff there briefly. So yeah, I guess with, with the experience that I had, policy and public affairs work uh, was a lot of it. But um, kind of just jumped off into the deep one with with the think tank. Yeah, and so do you have like a special approach for your Bitcoin advocacy? I can imagine that you know the people that you talk to are obviously not as deep into Bitcoin and don't have the big thoughts about Bitcoin that you have. Like, do you have a certain approach there? Oh, for sure. I think there are a couple of guidelines or maybe things I keep in mind as just like sort of a meta print as like meta principles, basically. One is I'm sort of wholly uninterested in trying to convince anyone that the price of Bitcoin is going to be significantly higher in the future than it is like today. I have no interest in, you know, in short, in selling people on Bitcoin. What I do have an interest in is like, you know, meeting people where they are and trying to get people to think about the suite of possible scenarios for Bitcoin, right? Like it could go to zero. What does that look like? It could stay the same, maybe. <laughs> What does that look like? You know, and it could 10x from here and, you know, reach parity with gold. What would that mean? So I think like looking at things probabilistically and not deterministically is very critical to the way that I go about all of this. Like, I, I just, yeah, dumb, not, not interested in telling somebody like, I know the future because that would just be laughable. Like, that's sort of silly. Yeah. What I can do is say, have you thought seriously enough about the possibility that Bitcoin 10x is and the impacts that that's going to have to your job, your responsibilities, whatever, whatever the topic at hand is. And so I guess that's one. Two is, yeah, I think I just try to be as like understated as possible. You know, I think when your goal is getting someone to care that Bitcoin is regulated well, or to maybe see that the world is a better place with Bitcoin in it than without it, that's a much lower bar than convincing somebody to part way with their their greenbacks to to buy some of it. So yeah, I don't, you know, BPI, I think as a, as a whole sort of reflects that, like, we're not salesy at all. I think we have a lot of caveating and like, yeah, I think we try to take a really intellectually honest approach to analyzing the scenarios where, where Bitcoin rises in, in price and adoption. And that in turn has significant consequences for the country. Another big principle is like meeting people where they are in terms of how they're used to receiving information going. Like I used to joke that like, you know, all BPI was, was like a project to put, you know, insights from the talk forums into like fancy sort of think tank, you know, letterhead. Right. Cause like, mm -hmm. you know, that's sort of what people do. And I think what we do is a lot more than that, but yeah, like recruiting, you know, offering this, like our, our, you know, our sort of one of our main activities is like this fellowship program. So finding people who have both the sort of fiat credentials to be taken seriously by a lawmaker, to be an expert witness at a, at a hearing in Congress, yeah. uh, but who all, who have the Bitcoin credentials to like do those aforementioned things like well, and supporting them to write, to educate, to speak, to travel. And, and grow our collective understanding of this. So I think that's another big thing is like, unfortunately, I think the DC world is very reputational. There's a lot of people just like shouting shit and, you know, competing for like attention. But I, you know, I don't think that like attention always translates to like results. And so I think another big approach of ours has been to kind of just be quiet. We meet with the people we need to meet with. We meet them where they are. 
we have academics and some really, really articulate, intelligent people uh, on our team who really win the trust of the people that they work with because they're not promising to know the future, but instead offering to help that individual think through the possibility of, of Bitcoin growing significantly and its, and its impacts, like I said. So I think all of that, you know, sort of, you know, are, are the cornerstones of my sort of philosophy around like Bitcoin advocacy, you know, and it's, yeah, there's, there's just sort of, you know, there's different games you can play, I guess, right? Like, if you want to convince everybody in a town that Bitcoin's good, maybe you want to run television ads. If you want to get more people to buy it, maybe you tweet nonstop about how it's going to, you know, hundred million dollars per coin. And, you know, maybe you post, you know, charts that have the mathematical certainty, you know, of, of Bitcoin's, mm -hmm. you know, appreciation. If you want to convince decision makers in Washington of certain things or have certain conversations, at least with decision makers in Washington, uh, I think it pays to be muted and subtle to not get sort of caught up in like likes or hype, but to just kind of like put your head down and like do good work with people and build real relationships and deliver value in the form of, you know, expertise and commentary and analysis. And, you know, the, you don't win trust by selling something to someone. You do win trust by giving them your honest take on the questions that they have. Yeah. And I think largely that's like what our, I see our job as it's like, we have a, you know, not everybody has the same view at BPI, but I think generally speaking, everyone's sort of aligned that Bitcoin is good for the world in America in particular, you know, and yeah, I guess we're sort of patient with how we, we, we try to make that point. You know, we're not interested in, screaming at people like Max Kaiser style and tearing up dollars on the Senate mm -hmm. floor. It's, it's worthless. This fiat, it's, it's worthless. It's worthless. Like, you know, that, that does numbers on the internet, um, but it won't move the needle with respect to serious people uh, in, who, who make consequential decisions for the country. Yeah. And so from, from your perspective, how, how far along are we? Uh, you, you, you mentioned, you know, you recently briefed like a bipartisan group of, a staffers ride in Congress uh, on how Bitcoin could benefit America. Can you share a bit about, you know, where you think we're at in terms of stages? Like, is this a solid topic? Like, wh where are they at? Uh, you know, it's, it's early still. I think crypto policy as like a sort of, it's in some ways, it's kind of been the shiny object in DC, like a lot of organizations, a lot of money, a lot of human like capital has been poured into the big tent broadly of, of crypto advocacy. I think the familiarity is like growing, like we're probably out of the first phase, whatever that was, but maybe, you know, there's like a generally knowledge of generalized sort of knowledge of like what Bitcoin and crypto is. I would say that the big things that are not present, people generally speaking, don't appreciate a sort of substantive difference between crypto and Bitcoin proper. Many people are not at all sort of convinced that this topic is like worthy of serious discussion or analysis. Many people are interested notionally, but like very light on facts and details at their disposal, which makes them pretty sort of manipulatable by, you know, a single artist. Like a lot of people's only thing they've heard about Bitcoin, for example, in energy use is like, Oh, isn't that, you know, it uses a lot of energy. It's like as much as some country or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that bad for the yeah. 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 So like, I think there are these like sort of, yeah, like no one's going to look at you like you have two heads. If you say you want to talk about the regulation of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency saying that Bitcoin might be like a critical tool for advancing, a, you know, sort of liberal democratic interests globally. That's like, a, you know, I don't think many mm. people are, are really there yet, particularly among like just kind of staff in general in, in the Senate or, or in the in the House. So, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done on. And that's sort of why BPI has these like big focuses on like one. Let's sort of draw a separate bucket around Bitcoin, because we think that that's sort of a different thing in and of itself than the other cryptocurrencies that abound. And yeah, the the knowledge about how it might be useful for broader interests, I think is quite limited. So those are really the two biggest drums that we beat, so to speak. And how, how do you kind of like conceptualize the opportunity for them then, you know, like if this is their, 
this is their level. You are at, uh, you know, an, an expert level after, after 10 years. I think in general, by the way, it's also really interesting, right? Like I, I think we could talk uh, in a very rational way about policies that you could introduce, right? That would, you know, substantiate the treasury and all the, like all, all the benefits. And it makes so much sense for us, but we still have to like fit it into some existing paradigm that the people that would eventually, you know, make this actual policy will see, right? So is there a way for you to, or like how you share, like, this is the opportunity that is there? Like, how, how do you actually meet them where, where they are, even if they, you know, conflate Bitcoin and crypto still in the, in the same bucket? Yeah. I mean, it's just like an ongoing process. Like, you're not going to be able to persuade everybody. Some people are going to, it really depends on where the source of objection comes from. I mean, you have some people who have, who don't like Bitcoin or are skeptical of Bitcoin and they've got fantastic reasons for that skepticism and, you know, disapproval. And they're the kind of person who really wants to jump into the substance and like, you know, maybe for those people, a, a sort of spirited debate or a, you know, constructive dialogue can, can move the needle. I also think there are people who are just sort of reflexively opposed to it. You know, it's just kind of gross. It's like, yeah, these fucking weird tech people doing gross, dumb stuff. Like they're all criminals, like fuck these people. And, you know, I, look, I, you know, I I don't think that the, the project of Bitcoin is or requires turning everyone into a Bitcoin fan. Mm -hmm. I think what it, what I'm really trying to do and what PPI is, is really trying to do is, yeah, I guess try to sort of prevent some of our worst instincts from missing from causing us to miss like a real opportunity with Bitcoin as like a country. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, I mean, there are, like you said, I mean, the, the best insight I could give is the one you already shared, right? That like, we often think of these institutions, these bodies of power as these like anthropomorphized entities, the fed, the sec, the CFTC, the white house, the Senate, like, you know, Ultimately, like you said, it's just people and, and people are inherently persuadable on some level. So, you know, it, for me, it's like, let's, let's talk to as many people as we can, whose views about Bitcoin that are maligned with our own are the product of like serious thought. And, you know, and, 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 and those kind of people can be persuaded through the type of work that we do and accepting that there are going to be people who are more or less unpersuadable, yeah. uh, at least by, you know, a white paper or a spirited conversation with, with a well-researched like academic. Yeah. And so what, what do you, for example, think about the, I, I would say it's a, the proposed bill, right? By, by Senator Lummis for the Bitcoin treasury, you know, that from my perspective, that doesn't have a lot of chance, but how important is it that, you know, she drafted it, she presents it, she's going to bring it to the house, etc. What's the significance of something like that? Very high. Yeah, I agree that the bill does not have a high chance of passing. In fact, it has a very low chance of passing. It's an excellent opportunity, however, to like sort of push the conversation along and get people to seriously engage with Bitcoin. I also think it'd be a great move for the United States. You know, we're actually working on a policy brief coming out of BPI in advance of a an event that's happening later in September on Capitol Hill about the reserve and kind of going through the objections, the arguments for and against and and kind of helping give policymakers like a framework for thinking about, you know, all of these trade offs. But generally speaking, you know, I don't find the proposal to be as radical as people make it out to be. I mean, when you realize that the government is an entity that like an individual or a financial institution or a hedge fund or whatever, you know, it, it sort of inherently makes investments all the time, both explicitly in the form of like other reserve assets that we may hold, you know, or sort of implicitly, like when, you know, the government orders a bunch of chips or, or whatever, or some parts, they're, they're sort of investing in some part of the economy. Every decision the government makes is a tacit investment or divestment. And yeah, like the proposal is a fairly modest amount of Bitcoin. So it's like, to me, it's this, you know, it's, it's, it's like, and, and you know, the other question to ask too is like these, these sort of inherent investments we have, we're really, really exposed to gold. Like we have a massive, massive 
gold holding. And, you know, we don't really have a lot of conversation and debate about whether or not that's like a good investment strategy, yes. right? We Correct. sort of just have a, a ton of gold. And so I, you know, I think that this bill was sort of critiqued from this understanding that we're going to take taxpayer money and just like buy a bunch of Bitcoin with it. Instead, I think looking at this as just like rebalancing our portfolio, shaving off, a, excuse me, shaving off a bit of our gold and using that to buy a little bit of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, yeah. it's really, you know, if, if Bitcoin were 2% of our investment portfolio, it's pretty reasonable. It's kind of the same pitch that BlackRock is, is selling to people, you know, like you, like you were talking about earlier with the ETFs, like might make sense to have a little. So I think it's like a pretty prudent move, generally speaking. I, well, you know, who knows how such a concept would get implemented. There are obviously like myriad concerns that are, that are very real and legitimate. But as an American, I would like my country to own a little bit of Bitcoin for sure. And, and yeah. I think the impact of Lummis's bill is still kind of rippling. And, and I think just moving the, the sort of window of acceptable dialogue from is Bitcoin good or bad to should we buy it? That's meaningful great. For, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's also kind of this way to draw people out as, as, as you said, right? Like, if it really goes to to the floor and and people are debating or asking questions you know the proponents of the bill can also have the opportunity to have rebuttals to i don't know perhaps sim uh, you know simplistic counter arguments as, as, as we hear often right so i also think it's a really interesting tactic to yeah perhaps get those sound bites or get those answers on paper right like as you said like it's then going to be in discussion about should we buy it or not it's not going to be is bitcoin a good or a bad thing or 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 whatever um but i like the spin of yeah just saying like we should diversify right yeah i think that that could be a nice you know kind of maybe that's the sly roundabout way to to get some in because i do believe that you know the first serious country to adopt Bitcoin in a serious amount. I think 2% is a very serious amount, especially for America. You are a bigger winner than, than the first country to really adopt it, right? Like El Salvador. I, I think it's just that added as well. I think it will kick off like a more global game theory type thing where other countries are going to be like, okay, well, what is this Bitcoin thing? Do we need to do that now, right? And then these conversations will start there as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, at least it certainly has the potential to do that, which is in and of itself, like, you know, exciting. Um, but yeah, wh whether it sort of kicks off the, the crazy game theory, you know, global adoption, or whether it just kind of, you know, is one more way of like moving the needle on, on, having serious Bitcoin conversations, you know, I, I'm very, very appreciative of Senator Lummis and, and think what she's doing is impactful and, and historic. So, uh, it's, it's really exciting. Yeah. So if you look, look out a little bit into the future, how do you see Bitcoin influence or impact like us economic policy? Do you see that in any way or? Yeah, what what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I don't know. I think it certainly could. I, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I, I think there are a lot of sort of just inherent things that happen if you decide to kind of look at the set of scenarios where Bitcoin, like let's say Bitcoin monetizes to, you know, that of gold, you know, and who knows, maybe there's a 10% chance of that, 20%, 40, whatever, you sort of make up a number and say, that's what I think the probability of that 10x is. Looking at that scenario, all things being the same, you know, one of the immediate things you would observe is like, well, American businesses and American people are now a lot wealthier even than they were because relatively we, we own the most of it. That translates or would translate probably into increased tax revenue because people are, you know, in businesses are making money here. So you can look at the kind of set of impacts that happened when the internet really took off and it was like domiciled in America and there you can draw a lot of very clear threads to like how that benefited the United States economy, how it benefited the spread of our ideas about governance. And I think you can map a lot of that onto Bitcoin. That, that scenario though, with the internet was not a given people had to work really, really hard to fight against mm -hmm. some of our worst instincts as they came out 
in attempts to regulate the spread of cryptography and the ability to conduct commerce online, we kind of had the same debate and we, we wound up on the right side of it and we've benefited you know, tremendously from that. So I hope that that happens with Bitcoin. I can also see a world where it does not. And, and, and you know, we have a different sort of set of impacts economically and, and politically from, you know, from its rise, if it's sort of domiciled, quote unquote, elsewhere. So, yeah, I mean, just, you know, I know it's kind of a non-answer, but, you know, I, in the spirit of intellectual honesty, you know, I, have, I have no idea how this is going to play out and, and think that it could play out both well and poorly. Yeah. No, I think it's I think it's a great answer. I think no, no one actually knows. I think it's just an interesting thought. I mean, I I love thinking about the idea of like the demonetization of real estate, although that might cause a big shock in in a certain place in the economy, right? It would be a healthy thing and I I think just the ideas around that are just super interesting, right? Like make make housing more affordable. I mean, building houses, you know, more interesting and, and all these things like that, that would really drive an economy forward, I would say. And so, yeah, I think that's just, you know, of course, no one knows, but I think it's an interesting topic to, uh, to kind of think about. So what, what do you find most rewarding about working in the Bitcoin space now that you're really doing it also? I, gosh, that's like a hard question to answer. I mean, I guess sort of all of it. I, like in my heart of hearts, you know, I like to sort of daydream like intellectually. I, I love to, yeah, like, I don't know. Running a think tank was not something that I like expected to do, but also makes like a lot of sense in terms of like what I genuinely enjoy in life. Like thinking about hard and interesting, like novel problems with smart, capable people brings me like a lot of joy and, and being able to kind of wed those interests and my interest in pursuing that stuff with this thing that has a lot of meaning to me, like I, you know, Bitcoin and then being able to do that, like at scale. I mean, like this project started off as like sort of a, like a sort of like blog, put like a blog, you know, is like a glorified, like law school, you know, mm -hmm. application booster of like, Oh, maybe I can start a think tank and it's kind of just snowballed. And, you know, we're now pretty large and we're, we're moving to DC and opening a physical office in Washington. And yeah, I think like a lot of my greatest joys in doing this have come less from its connection to Bitcoin and more because it's a really cool feeling and a rewarding feeling to kind of zero to one something like, memeing an institution into existence it's not as cool as memeing a new form of money into existence um but on a personal individual level is is quite rewarding um, yeah. and it's in i've just been really like humbled and and blown away by the caliber of people who have seen our mission and like what we were trying to do and who've gotten on board either who have joined us as a fellow who have worked for us who've donated to us you know we have some we have some large donors who have just sort of blown me away in terms of their support and kind of, yeah, willingness to like get on board with, with this take that this is like a worthwhile and like noble, good thing to do in the world. Yeah. So I've just been able to meet really fascinating, brilliant people, meet a lot of people with similar intellectual interests to myself, get the reward of like, you know, feeling like, you know, you've sort of accomplished something like bringing a new institution out of nothing, out of the chaos and like, you know, kind of making it real. And, and you know, I'd like to think that our work is having like a real impact as well on, you know, at least on the margins on Bitcoin's trajectory and being able to play even like a small role in that sort of story of Bitcoin's like you said earlier, we said earlier, like the negotiation with, with, you know, the nation state, yeah. you know, I, I feel like I've, I've kind of wound up with a front row seat to some really interesting stuff and, and playing even a minor role in that is, you know, surreal. So yeah, I've had a blast running this think tank, um, yeah. for a lot of reasons. I mean, you memed it into existence in, in a sense then as well, right? Like I, I think that it's just a really, I know, I know that feeling to a different degree. And I think it's just really cool. Like it's actually a thing, right? And it could exist without you. It could survive longer than you, right? Like I think that is just something that is a really cool thing to establish in general. And perhaps you will see like your influence really making a difference. And 
Yeah. That- oh, it's, it's, I mean, it's crazy. Like I'll, I'll give you a quick anecdote. I know we're, we're both running up on time here, but I was catching up with a dear friend last night playing some chess and it came over to my apartment. We're hanging out and he mentions to me that he saw a news article on, I can't remember the name of the platform. It was like not something I'd ever heard of. It was like straight arrow news or something. Like it seemed like some attempt to do like kind of no BS, like, you know, sort of just straight facts. I don't, I, don't, I, mean, I didn't really look at it. I have no idea. This might be a Russian propaganda website for all I know, but yeah. whatever this is, my buddy gets his news from this place and he's like kind of a techie guy, but not a crypto Bitcoin guy, you know, and, and this is his sort of daily top of the funnel for what's going on in the world because he thinks that this platform is whatever, you know, nonpartisan mm-hmm. and, and, you know, and he said he saw the, on the front page, the top article for the day, he said, you know, a uh, new study, you know, shows environmental benefits of Bitcoin mining or something like that. And he told me he clicked on it because, you know, he just thought of me. He saw a Bitcoin article. He's like, oh, you know, you and I have talked about you know, some of these mm-hmm. ideas around Bitcoin and renewable energy. So, you know, made me think of you. I clicked on it. And then I realized the entire article is just based on a Bitcoin Policy Institute study. And he's like, wow. oh, you know, he's like, I was just laughing and like showing my coworker who also gets his news from this website it was like, oh, my buddy runs this think tank. So that was like a crazy experience that happened That's just like dope. last night where it's like, you know, we don't have a professional PR team yet. We don't, you know, we just publish stuff and, you know, people write news articles about the, about the research that we put out. And then, you know, a friend of mine kind of going about their organic activities of like getting news about the world sees a headline that ultimately came from us that's talking about the environmental benefits of like mining. So that was another kind of like pinch myself moment of like, that's really crazy. (laughs) Like, I mean, it it doesn't seem crazy because that's like normal. That's just what you do. Organization, you know, think tanks put out reports and articles get written about them. But sort of when, when you zero to one, a think tank and it's like you screaming into the void, trying to get attention and then you know, just publishing a study on your website and some journalist somewhere is sitting down and reading it and writing the the write up. It's very like reassuring and cool and suggests to me that we're on a really good trajectory and also suggests to me that the, you know, BPI's greatest hits are not in yet. Like, I think we've done some really cool stuff with our summit, with our research, with our advocacy, just like the meetings we take day in and day out. But we're really, I think, going to sort of have a step function increase in BPI's scope and hopefully impact, you know, getting a larger team, moving to DC, setting up an office, like kind of taking the project from being this distributed and digital thing to a like physical and yeah, to a physical thing is, is, is pretty cool. So I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm very, I'm a little nervous, but like very excited for the 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 future of the organization and yeah just really humbled by the the support and and generosity of people with their their time and their their financial resources their relationships like so so many people have kind of bought into this vision and helped in their own way to get it to where it is like you know yeah, it's it's pretty overwhelming. Like how many people have to kind of yeah, I, you know, engage in some goodwill basically for something like mm-hmm. this to kind of just pop up organically. Yeah, well, it's cool, man. I think it's it's a great reward for the work, and it's people find it interesting, so they share it, right? I think I always call that like that's the power of the internet. Like you never know where, like what you create ends up. You never know who's going to read or watch or listen, and once you get that back, you know that feedback basically. That's just that's just a really cool feeling. That's a, that's really cool. All right. Um, yeah, I'm also looking at the time. I'm thinking if you have a short answer to this, I can still ask you two questions. What advice would you give someone interested in getting involved in Bitcoin advocacy or policy work in their own country? Figure out the state of play as quickly as possible. Who are the groups? Who are the individuals? Figure out whether or not you want to join an existing effort or start your own. I think there's a lot of instinct and it's a bit rich coming from me, but there's a lot of instinct to see a problem and be like, I'm going to start a group or an organization or whatever. Founding something is really fucking hard. Um, like I think like I have a lot of respect inherently for anyone who builds an organization, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, because it's like grueling and it, 
it would be awful to go through that experience and have it not be impactful or necessary. So my advice would be to connect with existing organizations, existing efforts, and f- at least figure out what they're doing, right? Are they, are they, are they using resources? Well, are they mm-hmm. doing the types of things that you would want to do? Cause the best way for you know you to get involved might be to find an organization or a group that aligns with your values and, or, you know, donate some money or time or apply for a job. And, you know, maybe it is the case that there's some need in your country or region for, you know, creating like a, an advocacy group, having seen like literally dozens of Bitcoin advocacy groups kind of rise and fall since starting BPI. I I think it's, I think a lot of people will sort of under index for how much of a commitment that is and how hard it might be. So, you know, figure out the highest leverage way to use the time and resources that you have and you kind of need to educate yourself on the state of play before just like jumping in. Like there were a lot of conversations uh, and planning that went into BPI, like well before it ever became public and constantly asking ourselves, is this really necessary? <laughs> like, I think almost like not wanting to do it is, is, a, is helpful because then you sort of have to, persuade yourself into doing the thing and so where we started was like surely this isn't necessary right like keep coming up with reasons why we shouldn't do it or don't need it and then if you get through that whole process and you're like shit i think this is actually something worthwhile then my advice would be to you know jump in and, and do something crazy that you think is 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 cool and and take big swings uh, in terms of the advocacy goals that you have wherever you are but just make sure if you're going to sort of take that big swing you you do a lot of prep work in the in the beginning to make sure it's the the swing you want to take yeah awesome thanks yeah last question and i ask everyone the same question what is a core belief that you will never let go a core belief that i will never let go If I had to pick one, I would say it's kind of this idea of like, leave no trace. Like it comes from the, I, mean, like sort of, I learned this like concept in like, you know, Boy Scouts. And the idea is like, when you camp somewhere, when you go into like wilderness, that when you're gone, no one could ever tell you were, you were there. But it's a bit of a misnomer. Like the real lesson that you, you sort of learn and leave no trace is that you actually should leave a bit of a trace in the sense that you have sort of an inherent moral duty to leave the natural world like better than you found it, right? You go to a campsite and there's garbage in the fire pit, you know, leaving no trace not only entails cleaning up your own mess, uh, but also grabbing the mess of like other people because like you have this duty to. And I think I have like just a generalized view about that with the, with respect to the world generally. And like, I don't think that's very controversial or insightful, but I do have I mean, my, one of my core beliefs is that we have an obligation as like human beings to look at the world around us and ask ourselves, like, what can we do to make this better um, for, for other people? And yeah, I, I, I think like that is something I'll never let go of that. We can't ever just become so enamored with trying to describe and understand the world as it is that we sort of, lose sight of the the sort of ways we can make the world like better. So yeah, I think just like having an eternal optimism for the future and Mm -hmm. like doing whatever you can to like engender a better tomorrow than, you know, the, the, than the day we have today is like, I can't see myself ever sort of pivoting on that take. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for sharing this and I really appreciate your time. Enjoyed the conversation and wish you all the best with, with your work and, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye. 